Excellent. Okay, so I think this is the lecture 23. Um, might be lecture 24. We'll see. Let's see, actually. There's one I have not posted. So let's go here. Content page. Yeah, so this is 23. Okay, so before we start today's lecture, is there anything that anyone has questions about? Anything relevant to any of the homeworks? How's everyone doing on the homeworks, by the way? So has everyone successfully been able to complete at least the step-by-steps for homework three and homework four? Has everyone been able to do just the step-by-steps for homework five? Has, it, has everyone started at least the step-by-steps for homework six? Okay. So homework six is going to be based off the concepts we have been learning. You'll learn how to instantiate objects and you'll build like a Dodger style game. So you'll get a real sense of one of the practicalities of what we're talking about in a prior lecture, where during the course of the game, you might have to instantiate a unlimited number of enemies, depending on how long the player plays. And so without the concept of instances, without having a constructor, this game would be impossible to encode, right? There's no way you could hard code enough of those values. Uh, so it's a, a really fun homework. It'll be, the, I think, the last homework where you actually have to provide any uh, um, implementation into it because the final homework is like the capstone homework. It's just you follow the step-by-steps and turn it in, but it's a big, large thing of step-by-steps. It's like double the number of steps than any other homework. And that's why you don't have to do an implementation on it. But it, it, it comes, it brings all the concepts together and shows you how to use inheritance, which we have yet to talk about and what I'll likely talk about uh, next, next, uh, next lecture. For this lecture, I really want to focus in on constructors. So we've seen kind of primitively how to create constructors, right? We've seen the default constructor, where if we don't define a constructor, and that's what's happened in our time class so far, so if you recall last lecture, we were working on a time class. Perhaps let me do a quick uh, um, back. Let's take a, a back around the inspection of that. So if you recall in the prior lecture, oh, we did a lot. We had this, right? We had this time class where we defined the properties of a time class as being broken down into minutes, seconds, and hours. And we defined inside of the last row of this UML class diagram, all the publicly available methods that other objects can interact with with the time, with each time instance, right? And so we have time, we have, uh, the constructor, we have a two string, we have a uh, to meridian, set time, set hour, set minutes, and set seconds, right? And so we actually spent, uh, pardon the pun, a lot of time implementing that class, right? And so e after each step, we had built a time tester class to ensure that each one of the methods as we implemented it was fully tested and validated and verified. So we slowly stepped through that process. And so, is there any questions related to this? Does everyone remember the source code that we had kind of stepped through? I have a question. Yes. When you're writing the class compared to writing the tester, let's say that you're given a tester like you are in lab, can you take what you write in the tester as to say, I don't want this to be less than this and not put it in a tester, but write it exactly the same other than you know the tester part? in the code itself would it be written the same way in the code so like, so if you so you could potentially merge your testers and your class that is not necessarily illegal in java but that's not what you want to do and the reason why you want to keep those two things as disparate classes is that the class the time class itself represents what your deliverable is going to be. So the time class is what you're actually going to provide as your, your work, as the thing that actually contributes to the application's ecosystem or to the API that you're building out. 
the tester is just to test well it, it, it serves two purposes it's to test this time class to ensure that it works the way you expect it to work but it also can be used as demo code as as mock code for other developers to see how each method can be utilized inside of your uh inside of your class in fact if we go to the api let's go to an api a lot of times java provides sample code in a similar way in the api itself so let's jump over here and just let's pick something at random like say for instance let's do string let's pick oh no well, let's do string ah format java api let's go to well java 11 is good enough probably haven't changed much in the last like seven releases okay so here notice one of the things that they do here just beyond just giving a collection of methods and descriptions and the set of parameters usually there's sample code that's provided in api well there's you can do better than this when you're working in conjunction with other developers you can actually provide them with your your tester files and they can provide you with their tester files so when you start to network the objects together get the objects to start interacting together so that they can complete the task that the application is designed to do you know exactly how to call on their objects what data you have to supply into each of the methods and what data to anticipate to come out of those methods without having to do the testing yourself you can run the testers then you could use their code as proxy code as, as demo code for you to then go ahead and use inside of your portion of the application and so actually what might happen in industry is there's um when you hit java 2 these tester files, they look really verbose. They look very bulky. I'm showing you the way to hand stitch these uh, uh, from nothing, from scratch, but you're going to learn a piece of tooling. So the nice thing about 2120, the next class, Java 2, which you'll be taking in like less than a month or maybe two months from now, right? So that's that like mid January, you all should be in Java 2, hopefully. So one of the things you're going to learn in that class is now that everyone knows how to develop code using object-oriented principles, you'll start learning how to develop code alongside professional tooling. So like we've seen, testing your code, validating it, verifying it is what distinguishes you as a software engineer from a software developer, just someone who codes, who just hacks things together but doesn't necessarily care about the correctness. So there's lots of tooling to support you in that endeavor. You're gonna learn one tool that's called JUnit, which is going to be a harness that sets all this up for you. So you create one JUnit tester file, and then you can put all your testers in there, and then you can run it against the JUnit tester, and it'll let you know whether it passes or fails. And JUnit testing, using unit testing, is what is used in functional companies. So there are companies that don't use it, but there is a greater sense of pain and maintainability of code if they don't use it. So you know if a, if a developer, a developing firm, an IT company is functional or not based off of how well they test their code before they try to deliver and deploy it. So you will learn tooling in the future. You'll learn IDEs as well on things that will assist you in being able to compile and execute your code. So we do all this from scratch in the intro level so that you see what's happening. So it's not magical, that you understand the concepts, the step-by-step -step processes that make your code actually run. But, but as you, we start getting into more professional, higher level concepts of coding, we'll start abstracting some of these tasks away from you and, allow, and allowing some automated tooling to supplement for us. You'll learn about Java docs as well, which will be able to use your comments and produce the API documentation that you see posted on Oracle's webpage. So there's a lot of really, and so to answer one of the earlier questions inside of the, um, one of the first questions we had is like, why do we use Java? Why is Java still an important thing? It's because of the amount of tests, the tooling and testing it provides you as a developer to ensure that the code you deliver is correct. 
And there's a lot of there's a lot of languages that are popular out there that don't provide that. So they don't scale well. They're great for tiny projects, like hobbyist projects, small scale projects. Python, for instance, is a language like that, JavaScript. But once you start getting into projects that are hundreds of thousands of lines of code, millions of lines of code that have dozens of teams of developers on it, you're going to be using a, a, a language that scales well, that tests well. It's going to be a language like Java. It's going to be a language like C Sharp. Something like the .NET framework, something that's going to have the tooling that Java has. Uh, so I guess to answer your question, after I've taken the scenic route on it, uh, there's nothing in Java that prevents you from merging your testers into the class file, but typically you don't want to clutter the actual class file, the deliverable, uh, with anything beyond what it should have. So if you have a, a tester, the concept of testing the class is a different role, it's a different responsibility, it's a different thing than what the actual class itself, the time class, should worry about. So you should distinguish what is the role of this class and it should hyper-focus on that. So testing itself isn't actually one of its responsibilities. Time itself should just model the properties of time and just the behaviors, the methods, the actions we need a time instance to get back to us. So if we actually want to then verify and validate it, we should have a class whose role is to verify and validate that particular other class. Does that, does that make sense? My question really is about, you know, let's say, for example, like in the lab, we have an account balance where we did the withdrawal, but we did the testing on the withdrawal to not meet, to catch, to try and catch an invalid uh, state like being less than zero. And it wasn't necessarily in the deposit or the withdrawal public. So let's, go, let's, go, to, let's go to that. So just so that I'm on the same page here. So we had this account class, right? that we had stepped through in class. Yes. And then we had this account tester right here where we had stubbed out our testers. And so let's go to the test. So with the test withdrawal, here's the example of the account tester you were mentioning. And then- Right, but I'm not writing the tester account because the tester account's already given. My question is about the Java class. Yeah. For withdrawal. So, Right. So, okay. So, so inside, so I'm not quite sure I understand the question entirely, but I'm looking here at the account tester with the test withdrawal. And here I see I'm creating an account instance and I'm going to test the withdrawal in, uh, method here. So let's go to account. So I'm assuming here, if I just hit up here, a lot of account tester stuff inside of, Hang on, this thing is in my way. I wish I can just make this thing go away. Okay, let's see here. We have, we have that, test new, test. Oh, we have all my testers. Did I never? I think you go up one there. Well, did I ever implement everything in here or is this? Oh yeah, here we go. So account class, account. I never did test um, the withdrawal though. Did I implement withdrawal in here? Or here, yeah, here we did. This is where we talked about it. Was our deposit and our, did I do withdrawal? Oh, and, and yeah, the, the uh, deposit. Weird, I don't see a slide for the withdrawal, but I know it's implemented. Let's go here into our code. So that was, inside of lecture 21. Okay. So here we have our withdrawal. Okay, so we had implemented the withdrawal here inside of the account.java file. So after implementing it, um, I guess, what's what was what was the question in terms of would testing are you talking about so try and catch is something you'd only use in a tester. It's not something that you could use in writing this Java account. Oh, I got, okay. I got, I have, I understand your question. So I think the question is, is in related to when is it appropriate to use the try catch? Is that correct? Right. Is that something that could be appropriately used in the actual 
It, well, so this is the, the, yes. I mean, you might have to use a try catch in a class that you're authoring that is not a test or class. This, this is going to be the rule of thumb. The try catch, and let's go into our Java file here. So here I'm trying to do this try catch on my account tester. And I try that on instances that I know can result in exceptional behavior. So we, 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 we know that there's an expected behavior, there's a general behavior, which means when we pass data into a, uh, into a method, it's going to do, it's going to do something with the data we pass in. So with withdraw, withdrawal, the idea is we're going to pass in an integer value, and it's going to do something inside of the account class in response to that. And generally, if it's an integer value, it should work. And then an illegal, right, an illegal um, so that's the general case. In illegal cases, if I pass something that's not an integer into there, if I pass a string into there, that's illegal because the data type that I said had to go into that parameter is an integer. However, there's this exceptional type. There's this type that is not the general type. It's not what we expect, but it's not technically illegal either. It's not illegal because it is an integer, but it's not general because it's not a value that actually makes sense inside of our internal model for account. And an instance of this would be uh, when for withdrawal is if we try to withdraw more than what our balance is, right? So there's certain rules, certain constraints that we can define that state exceptional cases. So exceptional case means it's technically legal, but it produces an invalid state. So we only, do the try catch block when we're requesting something else to try to do something that can cause an exceptional behavior to occur. So inside of our account, we don't have to do the try catch because we're not trying to tell something else to do something that's exceptional, right? We're checking to see if someone else, some other client code is requesting us to do something that would cause us to fall into an invalid state, that would cause our uh, balance to go into a negative. And we're gonna say that you can never have a negative balance. We're gonna say that that is something an ATM account will not allow. So then we're gonna check every time client code can request for our instance to change state. And if it causes us to go into that exceptional behavior, instead of doing it, and instead of just ignoring it, we're going to throw an exception object at it. We're going to throw an exception so that they know that what they did was wrong, so that they can correct their own code. So inside our class that wants to alert other client code that something can happen, that's when we throw these exception objects. So the instance where you might want to have a try catch block inside of a class you're developing is if you were to import something, let's say a scanner object, and let's say you want the scanner object to read some data. Well, we haven't explored this a whole lot, but you might have already realized if you tell the scanner object to try to parse an integer and instead you supply it a alpha numeric character like the letter A, it throws an exception. Right? It's, good. it's a mismatch exception, isn't it? And so since that's an exception object, every time you've encountered it up to this point, you probably just thought of it the same as an error. But what you could have done is put it in a try catch block and actually caught that exception and tried to recover from it. Does that make sense? Yes. So there are instances, so I guess to answer your question, there are instances where you where you might have to use the try catch blocks, much like we did in the tester methods, but it's only going to be with you're the client code requesting some change of state or requesting some dangerous, potentially dangerous, I call it dangerous, really it's exceptional, some kind of exceptional uh, result might occur from that. And so if you know that an exception can be thrown, you can nest your call to that client object, I mean, to the serving object into a try so that if it's normal, like if you don't fail, if you give it what it expects, then your code runs as you would expect it to. But if for any reason, it causes that, that object, the object you're requesting data or some change of state on to fall into an exceptional case, 
then it will throw back an exception and alerts you that you violated something. And then you can fix it. That's the beautiful thing. When, you've been, when that data is reported to you, then you know, hey, I can go back and I can fix that issue. Excellent. Okay, so yes. So, and then after that, uh, the ATM account uh, object that we had built, we did, we motivated into an even simpler state, right? That's when we started to design our own time class. And I think we did this collectively as a class, didn't we? We decided like what models of time and what attributes we should need. And again, we built that time tester. Now, the only thing that we didn't do, I think, last last week while we were building out our time tester. And let's just take a look at the code, just remind everyone where we're at with that. This is account, let me close account, account tester. Okay, so let's go to time. So let's take a quick look, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So we created a time class. We said a time class has three instance properties. One that represents the hour, one that represents the minute, one that represents a second. We said that we have the ability to set the time where we can pass in each of those individual properties. And then that method will then set the hour, the set, the minute, and set the second. I'll call these private helper methods. These private helper methods can't be invoked from outside the class. So the only methods that can actually access these, since they're labeled private, are other methods inside of this class. But here in set hour is where we check to see if the hour that's requested for the hour to be set to is invalid, if it leads to an exception state. And if it does, then we throw that illegal argument exception. And if we don't throw that, then we assume that it's an integer and it's not. it doesn't cause us to become invalid. So then we'll just go ahead and set it. But the only way we can get to this is if we throw this and do the same thing for set minute. We saw how to do that with set minutes, all that and with set second here. So we verify and validate on every attempt to mute whether it's valid or not. Then we also made a string method so that we can pass our time in a uh, universal time. And then we also had a two meridian method which expresses our time in PM time. I think that's where we left off, right? Does everyone remember stepping through this? So what I want to do now, up to this point, notice we have not used any, we haven't defined a constructor, right? We, we've defined a set time, a set hour, set minute, a set second, a two meridian, and a two string. And in our time tester, we implemented this each step of the way. We have a test two string. We have a test hour. We have a test minute. We have a test string, a test second. And we have a test two meridian. So the last thing we should do is actually start explicitly defining our constructors and then test them to make sure they work as per expected. So what did we say our constructors should look like? Or what do you think our constructors should look like? We're kind of actively developing this on our own. Typically also constructors go at the very top. So even though all this other stuff I've been putting has been going towards, has been growing downward, I'm gonna to go to the top of my uh, class file and right under my instance properties is where I'm gonna start implementing my explicit constructors. So I wanna move away from default constructors. I wanna move away from um, the constructor that we haven't defined. So we're gonna do public, right? We're gonna do time and I'm going to create a body. So this is the general, this is the general outline of my constructors, right? This is a stub implementation. So should my constructor take in any, any sets of parameters? Should we be able to initialize a time with, uh, I mean, initialize an instance of time with a time? Because what's the default time? Do you remember what the default time is? 
yeah, yeah all the since it relies on since since our model relies on three integer values and we haven't stated in a constructor in an explicit constructor what those values should start as the default value is zero so every time we create a new instance of time it's always going to start at zero 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 but now we can create a constructor and a constructor's role a constructor's job is to define how those initial properties should be set. And it can either do it if we know that it should be the set, set the same in every new instance, we can just hard code that, right? We could just do an assignment operator. But if it can be set uniquely on each invocation of the constructor, something that can be passed in by the client code, then we have to have a parameter list. So suppose we do wanna have the hour, the minute, and the second passed in then I can put a, 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 uh, a parameter list in between the parentheses. So let's say we can have int hour, int minute, and int second. And so here, in order to, now notice one issue we might have is that the local variable that's in my parameter list, they share the same name as my instance properties. But that's okay. I can reference both of them simultaneously in the same scope by using the this keyword on the instance properties. That gives me access to the instance property and the local variable at the same time. So I can say this dot hour. So now I'm accessing the instance property of hour, and now I'm going to do an assignment into it, and I'm going to assign it the value that is passed into the constructor through the parameter list. And then I'll do this dot minute is assigned the minute that's passed in to the constructor's parameter list. And finally, this dot second is assigned second. Okay, so this represents an explicit constructor. This allows me to set my data initially. Now, do you think that this is a good approach? This is technically works, right? I can compile, and actually let's um, clear this. Let's prove that we can compile. But let me, uh, I'm just based off of what we've been doing. I just want to get an insight of your intuition. Did I do this correctly? Yes. So we have a vote for yes. Yes. Does everyone like this? Okay, so let me ask you, in this new implementation, if this would be legal or not. And I'm going to do this as a comment. So new time stopping me from doing that. I can test this right now, but I don't think it needs to be tested. I think seeing my code here and my constructor here illustrates, is there an issue with what I'm doing inside that call to the constructor. What's the problem? Um, these are not valid times. That's right. We spent all this time creating methods that checked and then I didn't use them, <laughs> right? I just said, and if I, so every time I mutate and that even goes down to the constructor level, I need to make sure I check. You see how easy that is to miss though, right? So what would be the more appropriate way? Probably And now do you see what happens? Now what would happen if I try to do that? This line up here with this invocation. Work. Yeah, it's not going to work now because I'm offloading the work of setting the instance variables inside of my constructor to one of these instance methods, which is gonna be this one, which is then gonna offload that work into each one of these. So the actual location where the setting occurs is here, here, and here. And all of those, all of those sets, all those assignments happen behind an evaluation and a potential throw of an exceptional object. So this is the thing, every time you do a mutate, if you've 
identify that it's important that you potentially throw an exception object, make sure that you start using the helper methods you defined for that. Okay, so now we can potentially test this. However, what do you think is gonna be the issue now? What do you, do you think I'm gonna easily be able to test this? Well, let's see, let's see what's gonna happen just as a proof of concept. Let's go to Java C time tester.java. Oh, I got lots of issues. What do you think the issue is? Let's look. So my issue seems to be that, hey, I'm calling in every one of my instances in, inside of new time. I, I don't have, I can't do that. There's no, once I've, I've created a, a explicit constructor, Java removes the implicit constructor. So it doesn't exist anymore. So now in my uh, prior code where I was testing the time constructor with new time, empty brackets, right? Empty parentheses. I can't do that anymore. It tells me, oh, uh, actually we require three ints there. Does, does everyone see that inside my, uh, my console there? It's saying you require the hour, the minute, and the second. And what I got was no arguments. You didn't give me anything. So the moment we give an explicit constructor, and if that constructor requires input, then I should anticipate that in my tester, or I have to refactor. Now, this is a cool thing. We're going to refactor. We're not going to refactor all of our tester code, right? What we're going to do instead is we're going to overload our constructor to be able to take in three parameters, to take in two parameters, to take in one parameter, to take in no parameters. So just like you can overload a method, you can overload your constructors. And you could do a really cool thing when you overload them. You could do it in a way that you might not anticipate. I'm not going to show you how. So let's start overloading this. So I'm going to create a new constructor that's only going to require the hour and the minute. And it's going to assume that second is zero, right? So what we do is so we're going to do public time. We're going to take in an hour. We're going to take in, right? Yeah. But this is only going to require two parameters and not three. So since we already have a parameter, we can use, I mean, since we already have a constructor, we can use our previous constructor while building this one out. So this is the most verbose of our constructors, right? Because it sets all of the, all of the instance properties. So here I can use the, this keyword, but instead of using the dot to access a variable or a method, I can use parentheses to invoke its constructor. So I can do this parentheses, and then I can invoke the one that I've already implemented, pass it hour, I can pass it minutes, and then for second, I will just set as zero, the default value. Does this much make sense to everybody here, what I did? So what's happening is I now have overloaded a constructor method that can take in two parameters, and then it's implemented by passing data to the other constructor, the one that requires three parameters. I'm going to do that again. Public time int hour, just one parameter. And here I'll do this hour. And then I could do it either way, right? I can call the one I just made and pass a zero there, or I can be more explicit and do that. Because now I have two methods that I can potentially call from this one of two constructors that I can call from the, potentially this one. Let's do that one last time. Here, I don't want any parameters. I want something that is representative of what I would have from an implicit default constructor. 
So just calling the constructor itself. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'll just call on this and I will pass it to that original one where hour is zero, minute is zero, second is zero. Now I will get the exact same behavior I was already getting in my tester file, but I've increased the capability of my class to construct a time instance on just an hour, on just a minute, on, on an hour and a minute, or on an hour, minute, and second. And now just to just to make sure that this is working before we even implement a tester is let's go ahead and see if that compiles. And oh, that should not even be in there. I'll comment that out. And there we go, that, that actually works. Excellent. And so I should be able to, I haven't implemented testers, but all my other tester code should work. So what is that time tester or, yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so all of our other, our two string, our set hour, our, our minute, our second and our meridian, that's working like it was before. So now I can, in, create instances using any one of these. Do, does anyone have any questions with this? So this is a new novel way that we can use this keyword, not only to access instance methods, not only to access instance variables, but also to access constructors. In this one? Yeah. Well, the idea here is that I want to create a constructor that can take in three parameters, uh, hour, minute, and second, which is the ones that are here, right? And I also want to create a, another constructor that is equally as viable that can take in two integers, which would be hours and minutes. And on the instance that I don't set a second, I'm going to assume that seconds is set to zero. So if I only care about starting the hours and minutes, I'm always assuming that the next value then is uh, is going to be zero. I think that's how most clocks work. Like when you set the hour, it assumes that the minute and the second is zero. If you set just the, the hour and the minute, it's going to assume that the starting second is zero. So in this instance, I, I want another constructor that only requires one integer. And if it's just a one integer that's passed to it, it's going to assume that you just want to set the hour. And it's going to then assume that the minutes and the second should be zero, right? which is reflected inside of the implementation. And then finally, I'm going to offer a constructor that don't, doesn't require the client code to pass in anything. And the client code just wants a new instance, but they don't say explicitly what they want the hour or the minute or second to be. Then it's going to be assumed to just set it all at zero. Does that make sense? So the idea is that we give the client code a lot of variability, a lot of flexibility on what the initial state of the time should be, whether it should be have a specific hour minute and whether it should just have a specific hour minute where second starts at zero whether it should just have a specific hour and minute and second just start at zero or whether it just start at midnight right just where everything's set at zero does that answer your question excellent okay so do we all feel good about overloading constructors now and how we can effectively use the, this keyword in as verbose of a way as we've uh, uncovered Okay, so the next thing I want to do then is I want to, oh, I want to test this. Let's build a tester. So let's, uh, let's go into here and do the same thing we've been doing. So we'll build, do string, actual, and expect it. And then we'll do a bool in value for our test result effectively. Okay, so let's try creating a time class we'll call T1 that is a new time. So here, uh, our expected value should be, and I think we have a test just like this at the very beginning. So I'm just going to grab that. So I'll actually grab this code and then we'll build off of this.
Um, okay, so here I have my actual is going to be on my T1, and I'm going to two string that. My expected is that my default constructor should result in zero hours, zero minutes, zero seconds. Then I'm going to test, although I'm going to test like this. Uh, let's be consistent there. So we'll test will be the um, result from our expected versus our equal. And then we'll report this as constructor. And then we can even be more explicit where we can show new test and empty. So we could say what we were testing. Okay, now let's test another one. Let's do time T2 is going to be a new time instance, but let's just try the single parameter. Let's try passing in the value 13, for instance. And then here we can do the actual is going to be T2.2 string. My expected is going to be equal to, and then here we'll actually produce a string that should be consistent with what we expect. So at 13, that's going to be 1300000, right? Does, does that look good? I mean, we're live coding, so please catch me if I do anything wrong here. And then we will test this. So we'll take our expected value and we will compare it with an equality check to our actual value. And then we will do a printout. So we will do system dot out dot print F. And here we will do constructor and a new test. And here we'll put 13. That way we were very explicit about which test is passing and failing. And then we'll do new, then test. Okay, let's also go ahead and do that again. Let's make a T3, which is equal to a new time. And so here, let's pass in a minute and a second. Uh, I mean, an hour and a minute. Okay, what's a good hour to test? Let's keep ones that are valid for now. Three. Okay, three. And what's a good minute? 33. 33. Oh, that is a good one. I like that one. Okay, so then let's go to our actual will be the T3 dot two string. And then our expected will be the three, 33, zero, zero. Perfect. Then we'll, we'll go to test is assigned and then we'll go to expected dot equals, and then the actual. Excellent. And then we will print that out. And in fact, I'm just going to cheat here and copy this printout. Do that here. But now I'll put 3, comma, 33. And now we have one last constructor we have to check, right? So let's create a T4, because we actually have four different constructors. It's a lot. And so here, what's a good time that we want to do? Uh, let's do 12, 34, 56. 12, 34, 56. Okay, here, let's go to actual is equal to T4 dot to string. And then let's go to expected is equal to 12, 34, 56. And now let's check test is going to be assigned the result of our expected compared to our actual. And then finally, let's print that out. And here, this is going to be 12, 34, 56. Okay, I think that this is a lot of testing, although we should test one more thing. We should just test to ensure we can't throw that invalid state. So let's go to a try. 
And uh, let's go to uh, T5. Is assigned new time. Okay, we know that's invalid. So now let's go to this catch. Uh, illegal uh, access exception. Let's go to an illegal argument exception, E, just be the name. And then here, what we'll do is we are um, our actual. Will be assigned our message. And then here, our expected will be that message. Now, what's the message we get from that? That's, uh, oh my, it's probably going to throw in a, uh, the first one is, it's probably going to be this one. It's going to get uh, our first because none of them are legal. So it's going to go in the order, it's going to throw in the order that it occurs at, right? So when we go to set this, it tries to set the hour the moment that's not right. It doesn't even check minute and second. So we're going to anticipate that this is the message we're going to get. And then what we'll do is, nope, test is assigned. Uh, at, uh, I think we've been doing the reverse. The expected equals the actual. And then let's go ahead. Nope and do our printout. Perfect. And then here, we'll, we'll put 999, 999, 999. Okay, so now we've tested all of the general cases for each of our, our for each of our constructors, one with, with the default with no uh, arguments, one with one argument of an integer, one with two arguments of two integers, and one with three arguments, all three integers, right? And then we've attempted to pass a set of values that would lead to an invalid state. So here, ideally, if this is correct, I should be able to compile my time tester and it looks like it wants the data types that's completely valid. So we need to define data type time, data type time, uh, data type time. Okay, perfect. Let's go back over here. Let's compile, that compiles, let's run. And there we go. We can see now we got all trues there. So now we know our constructors are well-designed. They've been validated, they've been verified. Okay, so next thing to do is we're almost, we're almost there. We're almost done building what I think is a very robust time class because now we've defined our getters, our setters, our two strings, and we've defined our constructors. Let me ask you, can you think of any interesting constructor that would uh, that we're missing here? Or do you think we got all the constructors? We, we did a lot of constructors, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Let's look back on this. We have four constructors, one that takes three integers, one that takes two integers, one that takes one integer, one that takes zero. Are we missing any? Huh? That is such a great question. I love that question. So the question is, can I make one that takes in minutes and seconds instead of uh, hours and minutes? And unfortunately, the way that Java works is I'm limited based off of the number of data types. So if I've already said that I have, because it doesn't really know what it models when it passes in those numbers. So the moment I create one constructor that only takes in two integers, I'm not allowed to have any other constructors that take in just two integers. Same thing with the uh, with the constructor that only takes in a single integer. The moment I create one constructor that takes in just one integer, and I decide what the like behavior for that is, I can't create any more. And the reason why is that method signatures are both its name and the number and type of parameters it has. So so if and and uh, so if I decide that the and the method name in this instance is the const the constructor, the class name. 
So if I, once I have it defined as a constructor, I'm very limited in the number of, uh, of integer types. I would love to have that flexibility, but the JVM wouldn't know which constructor to call when it gets an integer value. It wouldn't know if that was capable, whether it should be setting the hour, the minute, or the second. But that is a, that is a good thing to understand that you are a limit. Like once you've decided on a set of parameters, you give it a definition and then you can't have those same set of parameters again. But you can have another set of parameters and those parameters can vary in the quantity and of the data type. What about this though? Uh, so, so we know we probably don't need anything else with integers because we hit zero, we hit one integer, two integers and three integers. And our data model is just a three integer uh, object, right? But is there anything else that might be interesting? What's another way you might want to be able to set a time instance? Let's see who's the most creative person here. Time zone. So how might one express that? How might you express? What's another way of expressing time based off of the way that we've been passing it in? What about? Let's see if anyone online. What about? And hear me out here. What if we pass in a string? Can we express time as a string? Right? In fact, we do. We have a two-string method. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a constructor that we pass in a string? It broke that string down into an hour that is represented as an integer, as a minute that's represented as an integer, and a second that's represented as an integer. Wouldn't that be great for the end user? Instead of having to parse that themselves, they could just take a time that's represented as a, as a string, throw it into our constructor, and it, our own class builds that into an instance for them. That'd be a huge quality of life thing for other client code. So that should be worth adding. Let's do that. And in fact, doo -doo -doo. let's take a look what that might look like. Here we go. And also, let me do this. Let me go to my time tester. Ooh, throw that into the slide. I'll edit that later. Okay. I want to, I guess I could either walk through this now or I'll delete a line at a time. That way I don't have to type all this. Okay. So here, let's get rid of all of this. Let's start by defining a constructor, just like we did before. Now the parameter type is going to be a string instead of an integer. And here, we'll, we'll represent, we'll think that the string that we would get representing our time is going to be the same way we represent time from our two-string method. Is that a, a viable like choice to make? I think so. Because that would make our time method, our, our time class even more powerful because we can two string it and then build new time instances based off of the string that we get back. So there's some things that we want to look at. Oh, let me throw more of this away. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, let me get rid of these lines here. So the first thing in order to do this is I'm going to create some local static, I mean, some local final constants to represent the index of an hour in an array, the index of a minute in an array, and the index of a second in an array. Because the way that I'm going to, the way that my strategy for converting a time string into a time instance is that what is the delimiter between hour, minute, and second? Does everyone remember when we two string, what are we putting in between those? Uh, you, we put the, the colons, right? So Java has really cool string parsing capabilities. We can tell Java to look for a certain symbol, whatever symbol we tell it, and it can look at a string and break the string into an array of strings where at each index is what was between the value we want to split against. We could that uh, we could split on empty on on like an empty space. We could split on new line characters, or we can split on on a colon. So what we see here is I'm going to take the time string that's passed in to my 
constructor, I'm going to call the split method on it, which I could look up in the API, but I'm just giving you a quick explanation. I'm going to split using my colon as a uh, delimiter, and this is going to give me back a string array where the first unit is going to represent what the hour is, right? It's going to, it's, if, if it's a valid time string, then it should be parsed into three units. At index zero would be the hour. Then you have a colon. So then the next value at index one would be the minutes. And then you'd have another colon. So then the next value at index two would be the seconds. Hence what these represent here. So now these are strings. So remember what our data model expects to store as our minute and second are integers. So the next thing we can do is we can call on the integer class, which has a static method that's called parse int. Parse int allows you to pass in a string and return back an integer. Did you implement something like this in lab by chance? Something that parsed uh, strings into data? You probably did the reverse, two string, right? Where you parsed a uh, data type and it converted back into a string for you, right? So here, integer allows us to take a string. So we'll take the string in the index of our, and we'll convert that into an integer value, local variable that we'll call our. Then we'll do the same thing at, the, at, at our string array at the index for minutes, save that as a integer for minutes, and then also do the same thing for seconds. And then the last thing we want to do then is to go ahead and then pass that hour, minute, and second to our constructor. Does anyone have any questions about this? So do you see how we can rely on tooling to go ahead and have even another better constructor? And actually, let's test this out. Let's go into our time tester here in test constructor. And actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a new one here because that one's getting kind of big. <laughs> And I feel like I've already passed that one. So let's do public static void test constructor string. Might even do with string. And so here I'm going to stub that. I'm going to come up to the top, make sure it actually gets called test constructor with string, very verbose. So anyone who looks at my tester method instantly knows from the main method exactly where to go to see all of the constituent behavior that's being evaluated. I'm gonna go back down on, under here. Okay, so now let's test this out. Test constructor with string. So um, oh, let's uh, set this up. I'm gonna grab the standard things I've been doing here. Okay, so let's create a, uh, well, I guess let's create a string. Let's do a time string. So let's suppose we have a time string that is 3, 33, 0, 0. I really like that time. Okay, so we will use that. And now what we'll do is we'll create our T1. Oh, let me declare the type. T1 is going to be a new time. And here I can pass the time string because now we've defined that constructor where it should go parse this and set this by int and hour and all that other great stuff. Okay, then the next thing we'll do here is we will go ahead and um, test this. So our expected value is going to be a uh, T1, oh, actual, let's do actual. The actual value is going to be t string. And actually, yeah, that's fine. And then our expected value is going to be, well, it's going to be the same thing we're passing in, right? And then we'll test 
which we'll, we'll, we'll take and take the expected value and check to see if it equals the actual value. And then let's grab this and print that out. So constructor uh, string, and then let's do new. I was, uh, we'll, uh, we'll cheat here. We'll do the singles. Okay, perfect. Okay, let's test this out. Let's compile that. Let's run that. And here we see it worked successful. That's awesome, right? That's really cool. Now we can take any time class ask it for a string, throw that in a constructor and make a whole nother time class. Super useful. Okay, so I'm done with constructors. Uh, I wanna show you one last thing that, what's one thing that might actually make this time class useful? What's one thing? So now we can create instances of time. Now I actually wanna be able to uh, maybe do something cool with it. What's one thing that you can't do easily in Java? Well, let me ask you, if you wanted to be able to get the time while you're in Java, is that easy? How do you do it so far? How have you learned how to do that in the lab? You, there's a system call, right? So you've certainly implemented things that can happen after a duration of time has passed, right? But how have we been doing that? We've been using system, the system class. The system class has what kind of method in there? It's current time millis, right? What's the problem with current time millis? How, do, how is the current time expressed in current time millis? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at this. Let's jump over to, oh my, go here. Okay, so let's jump into JShell really quick. Nope. So inside of JShell, I can do system.currentTime millis, right? And what's that give me back? And notice each time I call that, it changes. So this is a great way if I wanted to get the current time from the system, that's built into my system. Although if I wanted to express that in our time model, that's not very congruent, right? What time model is this being expressed in? Does anyone know? Yeah, it's in milliseconds of Unix epoch. And epoch means uh, essentially the start of when Unix was first created. So it's like January 1st of 1970, the number of milliseconds that happened since then. That's why this, this is a long number, so we'll never live to see it have to roll over, right? But the thing is, it always increases because of that, because we're always getting to be a further distance from 1970. But even though that's a great way of tracking the passage of time, it's kind of difficult to mentally think about reading this as, well, this is the hour of the day, this is the minute of the day, and this is the second of the day. But I could express that in my time model, right? I can take this model and translate it into my own model, right? And wouldn't it be more, wouldn't it be kind of nice to have that functionality in Java? We can make our class do what Java doesn't even do. Like this is how Java provides us with the time. This is what we've been doing to check the passage of time to generate things inside of our applications. Let's update our time class to do it a little bit better or at least more congruent with how we think of time on a 24 hour passage and not just as something that occurs and creates a, 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 a measure of calculable di difference. That's what this is useful for, to see how much time has, has occurred since you last checked current time millis. So we want to use it in a slightly different way, but we can make, take advantage of that. And we can take advantage of the fact that we can pass in a time strip. So let's go, let's, let's check this out. And I'm going to, I'm going to cut and paste this a little bit. So let's go to my time class. And here I'll go back towards the bottom because it's not a constructor. Well, actually, I'm going to put this at the top because it is static. I like to put my static methods actually even above my constructors. Let me get rid of this. 
So here, notice I'm actually going to create a static method. What is the distinction about this about this method being static versus it being instance? Well, so the advantage of a static method is that I can call it from the class itself. I don't have to create a new instance, right? So this is going to be a static method. What's the return type of it? This is really interesting, right? I can create a static method that actually returns a new instance of the class that it's defined itself in. So we're going to use what's called a factory pattern. A factory pattern is a method, a static method in the class that can build an instance of the class itself in there. So the idea is we're going to create a get current time method. The idea behind a get current time method is every time we call that from our class, our class is going to check to see what is the current time milliseconds and convert that into hours, minutes, and seconds, and then return that back as a time instance for us. And then we can use that time instance in our application using the set of methods we've defined in there. So it's going to set the hour, minute, and seconds based off of the actual time it is right now. So the way we can do that, but we want this to be accessible from the class. We want the class to make instances for us. And every time we call the class and create a new instance that represents the now, now time. Because once we have the instance, it doesn't change over time. It's like a time stamp. Does that make sense? Okay, so here I'm going to on string.format. And so this is where it gets really weird. Um, And let me show you what this call looks like, actually. I'm going to show you what this looks like inside of JShell. And then we'll break it down. So we know that, that you have that. So look at this. Can you see what's happening each time I call that? Can everyone see my terminal? So we know using string.format, if we call system.currentTimeMillies, that returns to us our unit epoch time. And then on string.format, I keep telling you, this is such an awesome, awesome, awesome static method in a string. Here, we already learned that there's placeholder values that can encode integer or floating point or Boolean data into a string. Well, the long values have special nomenclature for time data. So if we do TH, so if we do, if we do um, the... Um, percent sign one, dollar sign TH, that's already encoded in the format specifier in Unix. This is a Unix thing that we're tapping into to express that value as two hour. TH stands for two hour. Here, this is two minutes, and here, this is two seconds. So we're going to take advantage of the underlining Unix string parsing to convert this current time millis into an hour, minute, and second string. And then I'm going to grab that into a time string. Then I'm going to pass that into a constructor in the string constructor we just created. I'm going to save that in a local variable, and I'm going to return that. So let's just quickly test this. Not here. Do I still have? Oh, and I, I even have it here. But I'm going to make a new method here, which is going to be called public static void test get current time. We'll put in, nope, not that. And here, just for the sake of brevity, since I'm running light on time, we're just going to print it out. So, and we're going to print it out a couple of times here just to see. And notice I'm making this call to the static, to the static, um, to my static uh, class. It's a static uh, method call. So I'm calling to the class and I'm going to call that. So let's go back up here, get, what did I call it? Test, get current time. So let's go down here, test, get current time. Perfect. Oh, no, that should be lowercase. All methods should be lowercase. Save that. 
Let's jump back over here. Let's clear my terminal. Let's clear my terminal. Let's compile my tester. And now let's see what happens when I run my tester. And here, well, you can see it runs it so quick. It's not updating fast enough, right? For me to be, it's running it like 60 times a second. So I'm not, I, I'd have to wait a little bit for the next second, but notice I'm actually getting the time. That's what the time is, 12, 16, right? So I'm actually able to create time instances. I can even do this. Uh, actually, let, let me do this. Get time. I'm going to call um, to Meridium here and then test that to prove to you that I can make calls to this as a time object. Call that. And yeah, look, there we go. 12, 16, 52 PM, 12, 16, 52. So I've made two calls, one, and it uses the universal two string. Oh, I don't know if I've ever mentioned that. If I, if whenever I try to treat an object as a string, we don't have to explicitly call two string. Java does that for us. So that's the same as going two string here, really, just like that. But we don't have to do that. Excellent. So now we're set up for next lecture. Next lecture, I want to talk about composition. I want to show you how I can now use this time class that we've spent two lectures building to build something like a timer or an alarm clock, right? So that we can see how we can build other objects from pre-existing objects where they can contain a reference to an object and use it and add more functionality to it. So in order for us to build an alarm clock, we need to be able to maintain the time. We can now do that. Excellent. And so that's what we'll do next class. And then we'll talk about inheritance. Do you have any questions about what we covered today? Are we feeling pretty good about some of this object-oriented concepts? Excellent. Okay, I will see you all on Thursday.